Hello, my name is Ian Trevoranis. I'm the product line manager for Hariba Particle Size Instruments here in the United States. I'll be hosting today's webinar. Presenting today is Mark Bumiller. He's a vice president for Hariba Particle, currently stationed in Paris, France. And he's going to be talking to us today about size and zeta potential measurements of colloidal gold particles. So without further ado, Mark, please begin. Thanks, Ian. Do you recognize the picture here on the right of myself? I'm wearing a tie and a hot today in Palm Springs. I do recognize it. So actually Ian was standing, was sitting next to me, this was just a wedding we attended together, of a fellow particle scientist who uh, got married this uh, past April. Uh, we still wish him best luck. Today we're here to talk about science, excuse me, size and data potential, the science of measuring the particle size and data potential of colloidal gold or nanoparticles, um, nanoparticles made of gold. I'll talk a little bit about the instruments we use to take the measurements, but mostly focus today on applications. So should we talk about colloidal gold or gold nanoparticles? Well, it really depends on a few things, the size, uh, your academic background, and just which definition do you prefer. If we're going to define what a colloid is, traditionally the way I was taught was a colloid is a two-phase system. You have the continuous phase, which could be the water it's dispersed in. The dispersed phase, in this case, would be the gold nanoparticles. And to reach the definition of a colloid, the dispersed phase, the particles, would be in the size range between a nanometer and a micron. Since these are very small particles, they have a very high surface area. Since they have a high surface area, they exhibit some unique or interesting properties, and that's why we're studying them. But a colloid can be any mixture of the dispersed and continuous phases, what we're going to talk about today are really suspensions, or sols, might be a word used more by colloid chemists, of gold particles in this range from a nanometer to a micron. So often today, you'll hear me use a phrase, a little gold. But we could also talk about, about them being gold nanoparticles. The simple definition of a nanoparticle is a particle where one or more of the size scales is down under 100 nanometers. So if a particle is under 100 nanometers, we could call it a nanoparticle. But sometimes this definition gets a little confused because what if the particles are aggregated, as they often are? If we look at this individual particle that's 50 nanometers, we could say that is a nanoparticle. And if we measure the diameter under a microscope, we'd say, yes, 50 nanometers. Uh, we could take this sample to work powder, measure the surface area, use this equation to convert from surface area to diameter, in which case, since the particles are just touching at the edge, we might also say they are nanoparticles in the range of 60 to 70 nanometers. But if we measure this aggregate as the aggregate it exists as in an instrument such as a dynamic light scattering instrument, then we'd be measuring the particle of the would be saying a sphere of what diameter would diffuse at the same rate as this particle, and would probably say it's 250 nanometers, no longer a nanoparticle. But if we disperse this down to the individual particle state, then we get back to saying, yes, we are measuring nanoparticles down on the scale of 50 nanometers. So nanoparticle or colloid, in this case, we can use either word. I think I tend to use colloids just because I studied colloid chemistry in the university quite a while ago. The measurements you'll see today for particle size and age potential were run on the SZ100. I'm going to get kind of the, uh, the instrument in the background discussion out of the way today before we move on to the applications discussion. So everything was measured using dynamic light scattering today using the SZ100, both for particle size, either measured at 90 degrees or backscatter 173. Uh, we'll be using it to measure the zeta potential. We won't be using it for molecular weight today. But this is the instrument that I use to collect the data you'll be seeing in today's presentation. The SC100 is a system based on dynamic light scattering, which means that, as you see here, this particle moves due to its interaction with the liquid molecules it's dispersed in. We measure that Brownian motion, and from the Brownian motion, we can calculate the particle size. In dynamic light scattering, depending on the density of the particle, is good for measuring under a micron to about a nanometer to micron. We can get under a nanometer. We can get over a micron, depending on the density. But really, what we're taking into account here is that small particles diffuse more quickly than large particles. And by looking at the scattered light from this diffusion due to Brownian motion, we can then calculate the particle size. 
This is an optical diagram of the SC100 we use for today's presentation. So we have a light source, which is a green 10 milliwatt laser. Uh, we have sample cells. The sample sits in the cell here, and then we can measure either at the center there or here near the side wall of the cell, depending on the concentration. And also, at what angle do we get more effective scattering for the given particle system that we're measuring? So we can measure particle size at both 90 degrees and backscatter. The only instrument on the market is capable of doing that. And we're going to use the same instrument to also measure the zeta potential when we're interested in the surface charge on the colloidal gold samples we're measuring. For particle size, what we're going to do is basically, with that detector, just count photons. And by looking at this change in photon count rate, we start filling up a function we call an autocorrelation function. From this autocorrelation function, we dig out d, not diameter in this case, but the translational diffusion coefficient. And then once we have the diffusion coefficient, we use the Stokes-Einstein equation to calculate either particle radius or particle diameter. So we're using dynamic light scattering for the particle size of measurements. We're also going to be interested in the surface charge on these particles, so we'll be measuring zeta potential. Zeta potential, uh, as depicted here, if this particle has a negative charge on the surface, positive ions are attracted to the surface of this particle. And we essentially build up an electric double layer around the surface of the particle. And we're going to define zeta potential as a charge in millivolts. At this distance from the surface of the particle, we call that distance the slipping plane. That's the distance at which particles within this radius move with the particle, and particle and ions outside of that radius are just randomly located throughout the continuous phase. So the data potential to measure millivolts of the surface charge of the particle, but not directly at the surface. But actually, the slipping plane is a more convenient place to do the measurements, both in terms of experimentally and also this is where the real particle particle interactions occur. So to measure the zeta potential, we're going to in a cell where it's going to be some kind of a capillary cell. We're going to apply electric field. We're going to measure the particle motion. And by looking at the direction of the motion, we'll decide if it's positively or negatively charged. And by measuring the speed of the particles, then we can get the magnitude of the charge. So we're going to do the zeta potential measurements inside this cell where we're applying the electric field. And what we're going to do is basically look at a frequency shift due to the motion of the particle. So it's basically a Doppler shift. And so what we're going to do is look at this frequency shift. From looking at this frequency shift and understanding the design of the instrument, we can calculate the electrophoretic mobility. And then once we have electrophoretic mobility, we can calculate the zeta potential. I think the last comments I'm going to make about the measurement are when we apply this electric field, we have to make some decisions in the cell design how we're going to do that. Both how we apply the field and how we're also going to take into account that when we apply the electric field and the particles start moving, also the ions on the surface will start moving in a counter direction to the particle motion. We call this um, electroosmosis. And in the cell design for the SC100, there are some unique features. Uh, it's not unique that we found a way to avoid the effect of electroosmosis. That's something uh, that all cells require. Uh, but we have done this unique is we have uh, carbon electrodes here. And when I talk about nanoparticles covered with proteins, I'll be explaining why it's very useful to have this carbon coating. And also what's unique is just the way that we've designed the cell. We can actually apply a lower electric field, which is much easier on the particles. Uh, colloidal gold is a very tough particle. We could apply any electric field we wanted to that. It's not going to hurt the gold. But if we're coating the surface of that particle, uh, then it might be actually very interesting to be careful with that surface. Maybe it's DNA. Maybe it's um, some kind of a protein. And these cells are designed uh, to be very gentle to these samples so that we can get good, accurate data and also not ruin the cells and during the course of the measurement, which is a detail I will get to toward the end of the presentation today. The reason we're often measuring the zeta potential is we want to understand the stability of the system. In general, particles have no zeta potential, very low charge. It might not be stable. It's more likely to aggregate. And then as we do something to modify the surface of the particles, as we increase the zeta potential, either negatively or positively, it doesn't then we're creating more stable dispersions, and that's what a lot of people use the SC100 for. 
for is dispersion stability, understanding the effect of particle size, understanding the effect of zeta potential to use this as a tool to formulate nice, stable dispersions. So that's the quick background on the experimental. Um, the instrument we'll be using, the theory behind it, not much more mention of that. Let's now talk about colonial gold and the application we're interested in discussing today. Now there's a lot of interesting work being done in colloidal gold, but that's been true for quite a while. Uh, the Romans, back in the 4th century AD, actually created beautiful pieces of art, which this is called dichroic glass, where this has a light shining behind us, and behind the glass, so it appears red, if we took the light off of it, it would look green. And the only reason this looks the color it looks, this is nice red and pink hues, are because there are colloidal gold particles mixed into this glass. So this is something that's been used for decorative purposes for a long time. Experimentally, people have been studying it scientifically for quite a while. Faraday actually published a famous article back in 1857 on the experimental relations of gold and other metals to light. And Faraday actually created colloidal gold suspensions uh, that would look something similar to this. Actually, most of his were mounted on slides. And those slides are still around today, and they're still in the state of dispersion. So experimentally, this has been investigated. Uh, I'm using the scientific techniques since 1857. And uh, Gustav Me, who we owe a lot of thanks to for uh, the theory behind our laser diffraction analyzers, also wrote a nice paper in 1908 on contributions of optics to turbine media, particularly colloidal metal solutions. And he was looking at colloidal gold as one of the model systems that he was trying to understand and be able to explain during his papers published back then. But today there's a lot more interesting use for colloidal gold and that's most of what we're here to talk about today. The reason colloidal gold is used in so many applications is because there's a lot of unique properties. One of the properties being as you change the size of colloidal gold you end up getting different uh, light interactions. You can visibly notice them as particles go from smaller to larger, you can see from the picture here, it kind of shifts from red to blue colors. But also, if you look at optical density, if you look at UV absorbance, if you look at uh, all kinds of different experimental techniques, you can note changes in how the gold interacts with light. And that is why it's so interesting. That's why the particles are used in so many different applications. Uh, this is just my own little picture here. This is actually silver, but just looking at how gold changed as we were measuring different sizes of samples. This was just back during a demo a year or so ago. But because of this, gold used in all kinds of applications. Uh, you know, in electronics, gold, nan gold nanoparticles are used as conductors in all kinds of ways. Photo uh, gold is used as colorimetric sensors. Uh, it could be used in food safety. I've some research in that uh, field now. Uh, in terms of probes, since uh, gold particles scatter lights, it can be used for either dark field microscopy or, microscopy, or with transmission electron microscopy. Uh, I will show a slide where gold nanoparticles are used in a little diagnostic test. I think the example I'll show is for a uh, home pregnancy kit. Uh, as Ian had mentioned, uh, a lot of interesting work in using base gold nanoparticles for drug delivery. We're probably going to modify the surface and try to target these particles by modifying the surface. And uh, in catalysis, uh, the surface of uh, gold nanoparticles can be used either for selective oxidation or reduction. And I've uh, seen a lot of research also where gold nanoparticles are used, being, being investigated anyway, for use in fuel cells. But the example I will show where gold nanoparticles are used today in a little diagnostic test would be a home pregnancy test where uh, someone would just take a uh, sample of yarn, and then after a little while, the second line appears that tells you, well, that yes, you have the baby on the way. So what happens here, it's really um, what we're going to do is uh, it involves taking a DNA strings. And, uh, there's a complementary lock on two certain DNAs where it could lock onto a protein, and what we're going to do is search for proteins with this test. And pregnant women have a uh, excess of this protein, which is human gonadotropic hormone. And what we're going to do is lock on to that. And then in the presence, you'll see with your visible eye the lock on to the gold nanoparticles and the changing color. So this is an example of colloidal gold, gold nanoparticles used in a diagnostic test. And there's a lot of additional work where I think we'll see this come into play in the near future. 
So now let's talk about measuring these gold nanoparticles. And uh, when you talk about measuring samples, usually we like to start with nice, easy samples. Maybe we'll start using some standards. And actually, NIST has come up with three reference materials, which are nominally around 10, 30, and 60 nanometers. Uh, these are just results from the SC100 measuring these three um, standards available from NIST. And what I'm going to do over the next few slides is talk about our results compared to some round robin studies and also other techniques. And this gives us a little insight into just the world of particle characterization, which is always a little different than some other sciences. So let's talk about these GIST, these NIST gold nanoparticles, these reference materials. Uh, this is information from the NIST reference material 8011, which is the 10 nanometer gold reference nanoparticles. Uh, I sometimes poke a little fun at NIST and say, well, you could update the uh, data sheet so it's a little more modern here. They still seem to like this old script technology. Excuse me, the script font. But, um, the data is quite new. These are only launched about a year and a half ago. And if you look at the uh, sheet that comes with the reference material 8011, it'll tell you that when measured on electron atomic force microscopy, the size is 8.5 millimeters. If you use SEM, it's 9.9. .9. TEM, you get 8.9. If you use dynamic light scattering, this is just a reference result. This is just from the instrument that was in the NIST lab. You get 13.5. And small angle x-ray gives you 9 nanometers. So what size are these particles? It, it depends entirely on how you measure them. Uh, they also give absorbance data. This is for all three of them. And I'm just showing again how as you increase the size from 10 nanometers to 60 nanometers. As you look at absorbance, the peak shifts from 517 nanometers to 524 to 532. And so, you know, I know some people who make gold nanoparticles who don't even measure the particle size on a day-to-day -day basis. They'll just use some kind of absorbance or UV viz. And so if the absorb absorbance peak is at the same place it usually is, <coughs> then we're assuming the particle size is in the proper range. We, of course, recommend everyone measure particle size every day. But here, the reference value on the certificate is 13.5, and it actually calls out in the details of the certificate this is measured at a backscatter angle using dynamic light scattering. This same sample was then used, actually all three samples were used in an ASTM interlaboratory study. And in the interlaboratory study, the average value for the 8011 material was 15.8 nanometers. And this is just showing the statistics for the standard deviations, reproducibility. Uh, this data is calculated following an ASTM procedure for interlaboratory studies and how these statistics are later evaluated to report the results. So I'm showing this because when we measure the sample using the SC100, now I'm going to show you a fairly busy slide with results from all three of the NIST reference materials. You'll see when we measured the 8011, we had two samples of it. We got 12.6 and 13.4 nanometers. And I'm bringing all this up because the ASTM combined value was 15.8. And at first, within this was done uh, at the lab here in Irvine, California, there's some concern with, oh, what about that data? We're not quite where everyone else is. But if you look at compared to the reference value on the certificate at 13.5, that's very similar. If you compare it to the other techniques, actually I'm very happy with what I see, the SE100 generating for the sample. And I look at it and say, it's looking to me like it's probably as accurate or better as the other instruments we used in the study. We could then look at the other samples, the nominally 30 nanometers, and you'll see there we are very close to the ASTM value and also to the reference value here. And then this is the 60 nanometer, which isn't really 60 nanometers, it's around 50 to 59. So this is just showing, this is the data from the NIST certificates up here, the ASTM combined, and then the data from the SC100. And we conclude we think we're generating very good particle size data with the SC100 on the sample. So that is a easy, somewhat easy reference material. What happens when we start measuring real world data? So this data comes from samples sent into the Irvine, California Applications Lab. And as always, we check with 
from NERVS before we ever show their data during these webinars. And we have to thank you to Cytodiagnostics in Canada for allowing us to show this data today. And they sent us normally 30, 60, and 100 nanometer collisional particles. And sure enough, we got around 30, around 60, and around 100. And we called up the customer and said, is that about what you expect? And they said, oh yeah, within a few nanometers. Showing this as an experienced customer who knows that, depending on the technique and the vendor and the algorithm, you get slightly different results, but this is exactly in mind where they expected them to be. We also measured the zeta potential, mostly for reference, and they said, yeah, that's exactly, that's about what we expect to see for the um, zeta potential values. You'll see we ran replicates in very small standard deviations. So very good data and expectation with the customer's uh, results and also very repeatable data. This is just showing the three different sizes on the same scale. <coughs> as shown in the SC100 software. Uh, this is what a typical result might look like from the SC100, and what we'll focus in on usually is the Z average. This is a 30 nanometer nominal gold in the particles. Nice, lo nice, nice low polydispersity index. This is just showing the correlation function, just showing raw data. Some people include that in results, some people don't. We usually look at it because it gives us a little insight into the quality of uh, this is the Z potential for which of the samples for the 50 nanometer gold nanoparticles, uh, showing a Z potential of minus 38, and that's in the range of what I usually would see for most untreated quasi gold particles. So as I was doing research for the talk today, um, I found this data in the lab, and then I went on to Sigma Aldrich and just said, "Are two cells gold nanoparticles?" And sure enough you can get gold nanoparticles right in the same range from Sigma Aldrich. And then I realized, oh, that's why, because actually they're getting them from cytodiagnostics. So that was just a, a curious <coughs> coincidence and also, uh, I guess, not so surprising. They're very well-made gold nanoparticles. And uh, if you're looking for particles for your experiments, uh, they're available through various sources, including the source you see right here. Uh, we've run other gold nanoparticles for dozens and dozens of customers and potential customers. This is just another file I found in the lab, a customer who allows us to show the data, but requested we not name the customer. No, just a similar range of gold nanoparticles, normally 10, 30, 40 nanometers. So there are various sources, various sources for these gold nanoparticles. And we're just saying SE100 generates very accurate very reproducible, very good data for these kinds of samples. And so far, these are just untreated gold nanoparticles, relatively easy samples. But now let's talk about where this gets interesting, where the nanoparticles are the base of some other engineered particle, or in this case, this is a drug delivery vehicle. So this data comes from an article that was published last year in Langmuir, and I get the references down here to the article. And what happened here is they were taking gold nanoparticles as the base of the delivery vehicle. And what they were going to do is then um, use this as a prodrug to see if it could be used to focus in on tumor cells. And the reason there's interest here is if you just take uh, chemotherapy to kill cancer or a tumor in your body, what happens is the therapy usually goes out and starts attacking any rapidly dividing cell, which includes other cells in your body, side effects. So the interest with prodrugs is what happens with the prodrug is the way it enters your body is in a form where the drug is somehow inactivated so that it passes through the gastrointestinal system, for instance, gets into your circulation system, and then as the prodrug starts working its way towards the targeted site, perhaps a tumor cell, then what happens is usually through some enzyme enzymatic reaction, then all of a sudden, the inactive drug is transformed into the active metabolite, and then this can do its work to attack the cancer cells. So the work in this particular article is saying, let's model this to see if we can do something to um, use gold nanoparticles in a pro-drug drug delivery application. And the enzymes they're going to use to look for targeting uh, were genetically modified, they're nitroreductase from E. coli, and I'm going to use these two um, acronyms to describe the two different enzymes used in the study. 
And what I'll start doing now is saying, okay, so what we did in the studies, we started with 50 nanometer gold particles, and we knew there were 50 nanometers as measured on the SC100. This lab work was actually done uh, in France where I live, at the application lab just outside of Paris, France. Uh, this data came from uh, Wales, actually, uh, from the people who are referenced down here. And then what they were doing is they were incubating these with varying molar equivalents of these enzymes. And then they were saying, okay, as we use different molar ratios, what happens to the size and to the zeta potential? It was also analyzed other ways, but we're focusing on the effective size and zeta potential here as measured on the SC100. So the base particle size was right around 51 nanometers. And what you start seeing here is for the different enzymes, what happened to the particle size as we changed the molar ratios of the enzyme that was incubated onto it. And this is the particle size here for this enzyme, particle size here for this enzyme, and then the zeta potential. Um, and what you see happening, actually, this enzyme was actually more ordered. So you start saying, okay, if we have 51 nanometers for the particle size, the enzyme has a roughly 5 nanometer diameter to it. So if we were to coat the gold nanoparticle the enzyme, it should be in the range of 60 nanometers. So what you see here is we had to coat up to, we had to have up to this molar ratio to really achieve the coating we were looking for, up to 60. And then when we reach the molar ratio of 360 to 450, now it's looking since we went from 50 to 60 to 70, that's probably a double layer. So actually, for this particular enzyme, we could model single layer and model layer adsorption onto the surface by just looking at the changes in the particle size. And you should say verified by particle size. This was actually proven through other techniques and then also re-verified by looking at the particle size. You can see the changes here also with the zeta potential. It changed as we started coating the surface, and that gives another insight to what's going on to the surface. But this is the kind of application work, research work, we see being performed now in colloidal gold, where particle size zeta potential is extremely useful, and where the SC100, we think, is proven to be uh, an excellent tool for this kind of work. So this is really what we came here to talk about today, saying, sure, we can measure colloidal gold, particle size zeta potential. But also for more challenging applications, it will generate the data where you can have this belief in the accuracy of the measurement to know that you can model coating adsorption onto the surface, changes to the surface chemistry, and that's really where we would suggest uh, the usefulness of the SC100 would be. Now, colloidal gold, that's an easy measurement. Enzymes, proteins, that starts getting a little trickier, in particular with the zeta potential. Now I want to explain why that's true now. Because if we're talking about uh, a lot of uh, soft particles, organic based protein type particles, uh, when we first introduced the instrument, we were using gold electrodes, and I'm not sure if the color really shows up well here, but see how that's a nice yellow gold? And down here you see this is darkened quite a bit. So we took the cell. And we started measuring proteins on it. And what happens is the proteins, due to joule heating, just start baking onto the surface of the electrode. And then you start coating the electrode, and you aren't really sure what your applied field is, and you start getting changes in the zeta potential, which you're not sure if that's a change in the zeta potential or the cell being right. And then about six months after we introduced the SE100, we came up with a novel idea in patent pending for these carbon electrodes, which allows us to much be much gentler to the particle, but also because this is a high surface area carbon surface, uh, we actually don't have as much problems with the uh, ruination of the surface of the electrodes. Now, in the lower right is an experiment I ran about six months ago, where it just took an emulsion and ran off 800 measurements on a single electrode and said it was still working strong. And I just stopped this experiment because I went and traveled to Hungary to do a demo where I was doing protein work, and that same cell is still generating all kinds of good data. Now, yesterday, in kind of a hurry for today's measurement, I said, well, what if I just take a protein? And I just took some lysis up and was up at about 100 mix per mil. And I said, can I get like 100 measurements out of this? 
And you'll see there's a few outliers along the way, which they don't understand yet, but I'm showing you real data. And I'll warn you now, if you do 100 measurements of eight potential proteins, you might as well throw out some data and say that was an outlier. I will include that. No problem with very solid data up to about 100 measurements, and then I ran out of time. So we haven't really proven how many measurements we can get out of the cell for proteins, but I'm saying, you know, without even being too serious, I got 100. And compare that back to when we're using gold electrodes, you ran into trouble where maybe there were 20, and then you ran into trouble. But I've also used competitive cells where you measured two or three measurements, and you saw the blackening of the electrode, and you start questioning the data. So that's another one of the key messages we want to make today, is if you're working with colloidal gold and you're doing surface modification, and if that includes either, um, you know, proteins, dendromers, anything that's an organic molecule, uh, please check in the FC100. You might find that this is the cell, the instrument you want to be using for this kind of work. So that's the data I collected and wanted to show for today. And I think that was about 35 minutes or so, as we had said. Uh, I always wrap up by saying, you know, um, we actually have an application note on measuring gold nanoparticles here on the website at reba.com forward slash particle. And if you go into the download center, then you can have access to all the application notes, and there are hundreds of them on there. And if you'd like to receive information on when there's new updates to the website or to new technical documents on the website, sign up for the newsletter. Although I think most people today, that's probably how you knew about today's webinar. And uh, Ian will correct me or tell me about in a certain number of days, today's webinar, which since it's been recorded, will also be posted here for viewing. So um, that's the presentation for today. For today, And about how long does it usually take to get it posted on the website for people to view at their leader? Uh, usually two or three business days. It needs to be posted on a Japanese server by one of our colleagues over in Kyoto. So if they're on holiday, a little bit longer, but two or three days, sometimes much faster. So I uh, thank you for your attention in coming today. And uh, Ian will say, did uh, this trigger any questions as we uh, went through the presentation today? Or if anybody would like to send them in now, you can use the chat box to do so. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. I, uh, while we're waiting for some questions to come in. I'm going to type in my email address into the chat box as well. And that's just if anything comes up and you know, you'd know you like to talk to someone. Uh, if for whatever reason, uh, my last name is, is not the easiest to remember or to smell. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, to spell. You're easy to smell, Liam. It's true. <laughs> Much more so since I had a little baby boy, too. That's another issue. Uh, our general purpose particle size email address is labinfo at hariba.com. That's usually a lot easier to remember. And there's about six people to monitor that. OK, so we have a question in from Amit. Are the size measurements for a fluorescent nano? Let me see. I think he's asking, is it recommended to use DLS to do size measurements of fluorescent nanoparticles? I've seen a fair amount of data for that. Um, but what we have to be careful with is that the <coughs> fluorescence doesn't interfere with the measurements. So um, it's actually something It depends on the wavelength at which the particles fluoresce. And is the wavelength of our laser going to make them fluoresce, which is going to cause some difficulty in the raw data. So it really is a question of the wavelength that they fluoresce at versus the laser. If it creates large fluorescence, that creates trouble with the measurement. And uh, we can probably experimentally get an idea of what wavelengths that will happen, but usually we investigate that experimentally. OK. We have a question in from Max. How does the system deal with polydispersed colloids? Um, dynamic light scattering loves it when samples are very narrow distributions. And as the breadth of the distribution increases, it typically hurts the reproducibility of the measurement. So dynamic light scattering can be used for polydispersed measurements. Um, once that polydispersity index gets up, or up over a certain value, I usually question the data a little more and test reproducibility more frequently. 
So polydispersity makes the measurement more challenging. It reduces the reproducibility, but still it often is a V tool you would reach for, even for polydispersed samples. But there certainly are samples where the distribution is just so broad, the measurement becomes extremely difficult. So it's a challenge, but can often still be used as a tool. OK, and while we're waiting for the next question, I'll, I'll say, too, that when you leave the webinar today, you'll be presented with a link to go take a survey. We uh, ask that you would complete it. You know, It should only take about four or five minutes of your time. And we do look at all the survey responses. They're very helpful for us in terms of getting some feedback. Uh, was today's presentation valuable to you? Did you learn something? Uh, helps kind of direct what we should be doing differently or what's working well. It also gives us an idea, too, if you have any material you'd like to present at a future webinar or just material you'd like us to present. We're always happy to do that. In fact, we're ramping that up internally. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind, it's a big help to us. And it should only take about four minutes of your time. That would be a big help. So we have another question in. Why do we excite the nanoparticle at 532 nanometers in dynamic light scattering? Because that's a laser we put inside the instrument. Uh, there are different laser sources you could use. Um, you know, you could use a red laser. Ours happens to be green. Uh, we chose the green laser for sensitivity to small particles. And um, you know, as we designed the instrument, that was the goal. And that's how we ended up with the light source for you. Yeah, that's right. I think it's correct to say, and I'm not our uh, product manager for that uh, product. That would be Dr. Jeff Bodycomb. But I believe it's correct that as the wavelength drops, the uh, sensitivity is a very broad word, but I'll use it anyway. Sensitivity should increase to the fourth power as the wavelength drops. So that was our very good reason to use the green laser. Is there any particle shape information that the SC100 can give us? Yeah, so there's a theoretical way to do parent shape factors. And um, I've seen that used for certain oblate steroids. We have not built that into our software yet. So there is something called a parent shape factor. And uh, it's more that you could input a shape factor in some software and then get a more accurate particle size than by just getting the hydrodynamic, you get shape information. So the answer is not in the software at this time. The current shape factor is something we're familiar with, but haven't really decided that's worthwhile to build into it yet. OK. New question, if I wish to calculate the zeta potential of a nanoparticle at different pH, do I need to use a buffer to maintain the pH, or can I just titrate directly, titrate directly with acid or base? You know, I've shown uh, an isoelectric point study for lysozyme and BSA in previous webinars, and all I used was uh, sodium hydroxide and uh, hydrochloric acid. So uh, it's a whole lot uh, easier just to use acid and bases. Um, you know, sometimes proteins like the more gentle environment of uh, just changing of the sodium acetate buffer for, you know, the classic way you might prepare lysozyme. So you can use either. If I'm just doing quick titrations, I just use uh, acid and bases usually. And that generates perfectly fine data if you're just looking for isoelectric point information. OK, thank you, Mark. A uh, question from Mohammed: How can we make sure? How can we feel confident about the quality of our suspension? I mean, how can we get a nice suspension with good long-term stability without any sedimentation? So this is the classic application of using size and zeta potential as a formulator's tool to create stable suspensions. And we actually have a webinar that we did, what, just two months ago, Ian, on colloidal stability? Yeah, that's right. And uh, in there, we supply some information where we look at the effect of not only just pH and how that will affect the potential, and then particle size. I think I showed some information on salt concentration, on surfactant concentration. And unfortunately for the user, these are all things that are to be investigated. 
So when using this tool to help formulate new stable formulations, uh, you look at surfactant type, you know, non-ionic, ionic, or surfactants. You have to look at surfactant concentration. You might look at salt concentration and then also pH. And it's a series of experiments, and usually it's constrained by the product itself. Are you fixed a salt concentration? You have to see where your degrees of freedom are. pH is sometimes fixed, but it has to be a pH 7, and so you can't change that. And then you might look at surfactant concentration to change it. But uh, there are all those different influences on uh, suspension stability. And uh, I would say uh, the best information that we could give would be uh, on the webinar recorded, some of you, where we would go into that in more detail. It's already on the website. Okie doke. Now I'm... There's one more question, and I'm trying to see which slide in the presentation he may be referring to. I'm not having much luck. So anyway, Is it uh, about the shoulders on data potential. That's it. Yeah. That's question you're looking at. Yeah, shoulders on data potential don't really give us much information about the poly dispersity. So when we report the data potential, that average value is really the value we're using. And uh, I usually tell people, don't read too heavily into any little shoulders on that peak that you see. And I think, uh, as the previous question pointed out, you know, it's uh, usually challenging enough just to design the experiments to say, what should I be altering to get the data potential information that will be to the stable formulation. I think trying to read into the, uh, the graph of the result is probably uh, extracting a little too much out of that. Yeah, I, technically, the uh, zeta potential distribution that's offered in the frequency analysis has some useful information. Uh, not many users take advantage of it, and it's not as well known how actionable the information is compared to the uh, mean value. The general just one, one value zeta potential result that 99% of users use. But technically, there should be some information in there about uh, you know, the spread of zeta potential values in the system. Right, so one example where that could be useful is if you have two lots of the same material and the particle size distribution is exactly the same in both of them, but they react differently over time. You know, one of them becomes very unstable and the other is much more stable and you look at the zeta potential and the mean value of the zeta potential is also exactly the same. But one has a zeta potential distribution that's very narrow and the other has one that's very wide. So that's usually... Uh, the only case we ever come across where that could potentially be interesting. And the, uh, the case where the zeta potential distribution is wider is just saying that it's more likely potentially to be uh, less stable over time simply because there's a range of zeta potential values. So if you have two particles close to each other without much charge separation, then they're more likely to agglomerate or coalesce and so on and so forth. But pretty rare that that's used, and like I said, it's it's less clear how actionable that information really is. Less empirical evidence. Uh, and that looks like the last question. So again, if anything else occurs to you, uh, you can either email me directly, or I think Mark shared his email address in the beginning of the presentation. And there's always our website, haribit.com slash particle, or labinfo at hariba.com. And last but not least, Mark was talking about a webinar that we gave a few months ago called Measure and Modify Colloidal Stability. I posted that in the chat box, so you can find it at that link. That's where all of our webinars are, and that's where you'll be able to find this one, too, when it's recorded. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to once again remind you that you'll be seeing a survey link, and if you wouldn't mind giving us four minutes more of your time, that would be much appreciated. And uh, thank you very, very much for coming today, and hope you learned something new. Hopefully this was useful for you, and hopefully you have a... Uh, great rest of the day. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yep. Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye for now. Bye.